This morning, Easter morning, many of us have come a long way together. We've been on this, this Lenten journey leading right to this place, right to this spot. Throughout this season, we've followed the events of Jesus' life. We've looked at different aspects of who he is, different challenges that he brings to us. God came to earth in bodily form and offered these incredible, radical teachings. And this, these teachings, is probably the hardest part for us, for Christians, to understand. For instance, back in John 4, when Jesus encountered the Syrophoenician woman, he blew away cultural, racial, gender stereotypes. But that's it right there. That's the rub. That's that part of the message that's so hard to live into today. Because here Jesus goes again, challenging us where we are. Today we still have all of those same things. Cultural, racial, and gender stereotypes. One of the things Jesus didn't do was he didn't take away anybody's ability to think and react. He didn't take away our ability to feel. And maybe that was the problem. Maybe if when Jesus had come, we had all been transformed, humanity had been changed into these automatons that would respond the way God would have us respond to everything, it would be so much easier. But instead, we we're left with this freedom to accept Jesus' radical new kingdom or reject it. Everybody who heard him, everybody who encountered him in person had this opportunity to accept or reject him. When Jesus had this encounter with the Syrophoenician woman in John 4, this is the woman at the well, it's up to us this morning, this day, this generation to study that story to study that passage and to understand what's going on and, and what Jesus is doing and what's happening in that passage. When God came to earth, it was the religious leaders who used their freedom to reject Jesus and to dismiss the possibility of a kingdom of heaven. They didn't want a new reality. They liked the reality that they had because the reality that they had included power and authority. God continues to give us this freedom to decide whether or not to accept Jesus' kingdom or to avoid the challenge that it makes to our lifestyle. We can accept the wonder, the beauty, the majesty, and the fulfillment of a life in Christ. All we have to do to think about the beauty is to step outside this door and look at what a random collection of flowers being put together has begun to create before our very eyes. The religious leaders who were around when Jesus walked on the earth decided to do things their way. They didn't want to do things Jesus' way. And we come to the grave this morning with this freedom. Mary Magdalene was the first to arrive that first Easter morning. And it's great to gather together in the stillness, in the quiet of a morning like this. To gather together where it is still calm and peaceful outside. And to try to imagine her reaching the tomb. She knew what she expected to find there. The stone would be there. She hadn't worked out how she'd have it removed, but she was going to anoint the body. But she arrives to find that the stone is already gone. The religious and political leaders rejected Jesus and put him on the cross. And at this point, that's all Mary knows. She finds the stone gone and an empty tomb, and she's upset. She goes to Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, and tells them what she saw. They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they put him. And the two disciples run to the tomb. I love the bit where John, who's writing, says, I ran faster. I mean, surely we'd include that, too. I mean, we ran, but, <laughs> you know, old Peter, lead foot, can't get, get there. They arrive at the tomb, the disciple whom Jesus loved first. But he pauses at the door. 
He looks in, he sees there's nothing there. And then Peter, when he gets there, rushes in and goes in and he sees the linen wrappings, the face cloth wasn't with the others. It's set, it's rolled and set to the side. John then follows Jesus in and he sees and he believes and then they go home. And again, we're left with Mary and the quiet and the peace and the calm of the morning. The fourth gospel doesn't tell us whether or not Peter believed at this point. It suggests that John did, but then it goes on to very quickly add, but they didn't understand. John saw and believed, but he didn't get it. And outside observers like us, we don't know what Mary was thinking, what she saw, what she felt. All we know is she didn't leave. She stayed. She kept vigil, looking in. And in her grief, in between her, her tears running down her face, as she, she glanced into the tomb, she sees two heavenly figures there. Why are you weeping? They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they put him, she said. She, the fourth gospel leaves some details out. How did they get in there? What did she think when she looks up and she sees something in the tomb? But then she hears someone behind her. Again, the voice asks, Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She looks back and she assumes it's the gardener. And she's like, Sir! I mean, I can picture her saying, seriously, if you, you can just tell me where you've taken the body, I will go and take him away. This is the stunning moment for which we have been waiting. Humanity failed miserably, and we continue to fail miserably. We continue to need God's grace. We continue to re-crucify Christ with everything we do that serves to separate us from God. When we don't live into this divine calling in Christ, we put Jesus back on that cross again. And so we've been waiting for this moment. We've been waiting because we would almost certainly do the exact same thing today as the religious and political leaders of first century Palestine. And instead of listening to Jesus and following him as God incarnate, we would reject him, spit upon him, torture him, beat him during his interrogation. We would take him through the mock trial with the presumed guilty verdict even before it began. And finally, we would nail him to the cross just to get rid of him once and for all. When Jesus came to earth, humanity remained free to accept or reject him. People could choose whether or not they wanted Jesus. What does it mean to choose Jesus? What, is, what was it that he was offering? What was it that was so bad about this kingdom of heaven that made people so upset? Was it the healing is it the, the peace where there's unrest? Is it the water for the thirsty? Food for the hungry? Is it the unedited possibility of love? That's what Jesus' kingdom is based on. And that's what Jesus came to bring into the world. And so here we stand this morning with Mary, still at the tomb. We have her weeping and asking the gardener, where is my Lord? Where is this one whom I came to find? In the stillness of the morning, the suspense for her is building. I hope you can feel it too. When God came to earth in bodily form, people weren't ready. We weren't ready. They didn't understand what he was offering. <coughs> what they wanted and what they got were two different things. What they wanted, or maybe I should even say, what we want is a Messiah like the one from last week. The Palm Sunday Messiah. The parade. The conquering Jesus. The one who makes the big triumphal entry. The one who comes in, rocks the house and says, I'm God, I'm here, and this is how it's going to be. We don't want a suffering Messiah who can be slain and nailed to the bitter cross. 
They went to the tomb to find him, but he wasn't there. Where is Jesus? We find him where God is at work. We find him in the beauty of people who are a very diverse <laughs> lot coming together and randomly placing flowers on a cross like the one outside our sanctuary to create something beautiful. That's God at work. That's the presence of Christ. We find Jesus in worship. People raising their voices together to say, Hallelujah! Christ the Lord is risen. We find him in hate, restoring broken lives. In the streets of Calcutta, with the Sisters of Mercy and other mission projects like Mother Teresa's charity. We find Jesus with the suffering, the lonely, those who weep, those who have been hurt, scorned, and spit upon. He says to each one, all in that simple word when he says, Mary. Suddenly, she is able to see. He says to each one, I've been hurt too. I loved humanity so much. I came to earth to show them how great communion with God could be. You know what they did? They spit on me, beat me, tried to kill me several times before they actually succeeded. But before they killed me, they, they put me through this terrible trial. And you know what? I still love them anyway. I still love you anyway. Jesus will not be kept in the ground, locked in the tomb and set aside in order to be able to be brought out for our convenience when we need him in the hospital or when we want him to show up to bless a wedding or to give us a few words of comfort at a funeral. Jesus won't be kept away. You know why? The grave was empty. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! Mary came expecting to find him in the tomb. But he wasn't there. In the cool air of the morning, Jesus said, Mary. And hearing her name, shook her from her tears. Where is Jesus? She found him. Not in the tomb, but alive and at work. You know what? He loves each and every one of us very, 